Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. I'm the author of several books on the Garmin G1000, 3000, 5000, and Perspective Glass Cockpits, and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. Today, I'll be talking with Dr. Dylan Caldwell about things you should do before going for your next FAA flight physical, if you want to increase the odds of passing that physical. Last week in episode 243, we talked with Catherine Cavagnaro about slips and about the midair collision at Watsonville, California. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 243. And this is a listener-supported show, and yes, we're still ad-free. And yet we're constantly giving you new tips that you can use when you fly that might help save your life. So think about what that might be worth to you or what you might pay a flight instructor for an hour of ground instruction. And then sign up now to become a member to support the show financially at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And when you do, I'll read your name on the show. This week in the news, laser incidents in the U.S. are on the rise. There's a U.S. airline that's flown its first electric aircraft. And a pilot is being charged for violating a state law while flying, and we'll tell you about that law. All this and more, and the news starts now. From NASDAQ.com, laser incidents reported by U.S. pilots hit record in 2021. The number of reported incidents involving aiming of lasers at U.S. airplanes hit a record in 2021, according to a government report, which also said regulators should do more to address the problem. Reported laser incidents rose 42% in 2021 to 9,273 incidents. The FAA asked pilots to complete laser pointing incident questionnaires upon landing, but GAO said FAA received responses for about 12% of the 8,221 laser incidents that occurred over a recent one year period. The FAA said that in order to reduce attacks, the agency conducts outreach to educate the public about the hazard of lasers aimed at aircraft. They noted it can issue fines up to $11,000 per violation and up to $30,800 for multiple laser incidents. The agency noted it could issue fines for up to $11,000 per violation. And unfortunately, I think this problem is not going to go away. I used to think that with education, we'd see fewer laser strikes, but that doesn't appear to be the case. From ABC7Chicago.com, pilot survives after small plane crash in Florida neighborhood. A pilot survived after the small plane he was flying ran out of gas and crashed in an Orlando, Florida neighborhood Friday. A passing motorist captured video of the crash, showing the plane nosedived into a street and slammed into a brick mailbox before coming to rest, narrowly missing passing cars. The pilot, Ramey Collin, told ABC News it was supposed to be a test flight for the airplane that had recently come out of its annual inspection. Collin said that he had been distracted by fixing the plane's faulty radio and failed to check his fuel level. The plane ran out of gas and lost all power. Collins said he did not see any other place where he could land, so he decided to sacrifice the plane and did his best not to injure anyone. He said he suffered bruising but was otherwise okay, and he was the only one on the plane. From GeneralAviationNews.com, plane flips after passenger inadvertently applies brakes. According to the NTSB report, the pilot, who was landing at the airport in Medina, New York, which, by the way, is north of New York City along the Hudson Valley, after a local flight. A passenger was in the rear seat of the tailwheel-equipped Dakota S-18-160. During touchdown, the airplane started to nose over, and the pilot realized that the passenger had his feet on the brakes. He yelled at the passenger to get his feet off the brakes, but it was too late to prevent the airplane from nosing over. The plane flipped over, inverted, and came to a complete stop. Probable cause, the passenger's inadvertent application of the rear brakes during landing, which resulted in a nose over. And I think this is just a good example of why we need to give really excellent passenger briefings before we bring people on board with us. From generalaviationnews.com, new student freezes on controls. This comes from an ASRS NASA report that was written by the pilot. He wrote, I was instructing a student pilot on his second lesson after a two-week gap from the first one. We started the aircraft and received a clearance to the active runway and began our taxi. The winds were strong but not uncontrollable, but my student had difficulty maintaining the taxiway center line. On a larger deviation to the left, my student reacted by putting in an abrupt full right rudder deflection and applied brake. I declared my controls, and my student froze on the controls and failed to follow procedure. By the time I was able to get him to respond, 
The aircraft was past the taxiway edge, and the right main gear struck the light. At this point, we notified tower, completed a circuit on the taxiway to verify function, and took the aircraft back to the ramp for inspection by the mechanic. The mechanic verified the dent, inspected for any further damage, and approved the aircraft for continued operation. A flight was then commenced without incident. The training environment brings a lot of unusual reactions to stress, and in the future I will do a better job of re-emphasizing the positive exchange of controls in these early lessons, especially when potentially challenging winds exist. And I just want to mention that I had only one instance where we had a real problem with positive exchange of the controls, and that was with an instrument uh, client. We had uh, gotten down low to the airport, and we're just about to start the missed approach when I said, I have the controls. And the pilot said, why? And continue to hang on to the controls. I think he was concerned that I thought he had done something wrong, and he knew that he hadn't. I tried to explain to him because we were about to get hit by another aircraft, and he finally relinquished the controls. Also from generalaviationnews.com, autopilot refuses to disengage. This is also from ASRS. The pilot wrote, when attempting to disengage the autopilot, or AP, the servos refused to release control of the aircraft. The PTREM began raising the nose while I pushed the nose forward to preclude a stall. Altitude was 9,500 feet. When the AP would not disengage, I pushed the disengage button on the yoke. When that didn't work, I pulled the circuit breaker to the autopilot. That didn't work either. The servos refused to release. I then turned off the G5 flight instruments, I think that's the Garmin G5, and the servos released. After approximately 5 to 10 minutes, I turned the G5 flight instruments back on and hand flew the aircraft to its destination. I am having avionics technicians look at the autopilot and the installation. I hadn't used the autopilot to much extent until yesterday. And from avweb.com comes a story about a Diamond DA-42 Twin Star accident. At about 11.45 Eastern Time, the airplane was substantially damaged during a forced landing when its pilots were unable to restart an engine after simulated one-engine inoperative flight. The flight instructor, student pilot, and pilot-rated passenger were not injured. Visual conditions prevailed. While conducting a simulated engine-out drill, the pilot followed the checklist and secured the right engine. During the drill, the plane descended a few hundred feet. Using the checklist, they then initiated the restart procedure, which took some time to complete. They slowly increased manifold pressure to keep shock cooling to a minimum, and as they advanced the throttle, it became apparent that the engine was not producing power and the propeller was only windmilling. They then performed the checklist again in an attempt to restore engine power, but without success. At this point, the airplane had descended to the ridge tops, and the flight instructor elected to perform a forced landing to a field. The touchdown was smooth and under control, but the airplane then slid into a ditch crossing the field and nosed over. And from FlyingMag.com, Harbor Air makes first point-to-point -point flight with electric beaver. Richmond, Canada-based Harbor Air has chalked up another milestone during flight testing of a retrofitted electric DHC-2 de Havilland beaver on floats. On Wednesday, the so-called e-beaver made its first point-to-point -point flight a 45-mile journey from Harbor Air's terminal adjacent to the Vancouver International Airport to Pat Bay near Victoria International Airport. After landing, the e-beaver had ample reserve battery power remaining. The Harbor Air experimental e-beaver had been converted to a lithium-ion battery-enabled 750-horsepower all-electric motor manufactured by Seattle-based MagnaX. The airline aims to achieve certification to begin all-electric commercial flights with passengers as soon as next year. Harbor Air has been pioneering development of all-electric flights since the first successful e-beaver flight test in 2019. The company operates a de Havilland fleet of beavers, DHC-3 otters, and DHC-6 twin otters to carry local commuters and tourists. The airline, which carries more than half a million passengers per year on 30,000 commercial flights, has set a goal to eventually convert its entire fleet to all-electric aircraft. From uinterview.com, melting Swiss glacier reveals plane crash site and human remains lost in 1968. High temperatures in Europe and around the world have been affecting plenty of places, and glacial melt in Switzerland allowed a 50-year-old crashed plane to finally be recovered. According to Swiss authorities, the plane pieces recovered at a glacier in the Swiss Alps date back to a plane which crashed at this location on June 30, 1968. It was reported that the remains of three bodies belonging to a teacher medical officer, and one of their sons from Zurich were all found at the crash site. The aircraft was a Piper Cherokee. 
Heavy melting has caused danger to hiking trails in these glaciers, as the rivers of runoff water can appear, and once steady glaciers can collapse entirely. Where the plane crash was situated at the Aletsch Glacier, it was initially too remote to be recovered with technology available at the time. Recovery efforts will be underway soon. Massive glaciers in the country have severely receded all over the region, and two other remains of dead hikers have been found in other areas of the Swiss Alps. A similar situation has been unfolding stateside. Lake Mead, the huge drinking water reservoir serving much of the U.S. southwest, has revealed four sets of human remains as water levels continue to lower. And from Catherine'sReport.com, this was sent to us by listener Troy Wistman. Another first flight by a new owner resulted in a fatality. Sadly, Wichita County, Texas deputies had to respond to a single-engine plane fatality at Wichita Valley Airport. A person drove from Arkansas to purchase this plane, and it crashed on takeoff. They were pinned in the plane when it came off the runway, flipped, and caught fire. DPS had the scene, and we helped secure the area waiting on FAA arrival. Prayers to the family of the pilot and prayers for the responders involved. And I looked it up. The aircraft was an experimental, a Smythe Sidewinder T. And I was particularly interested in this story because years ago I did a search through the NTSB database on phrases such as recently purchased, and I found a large number of accidents that occurred on pilots' first flights of their new aircraft or flights that occurred within the first week or two after purchasing their new aircraft. So if you're buying an airplane, unless you're really familiar with that particular aircraft, it really pays to bring along somebody with you who has a lot of experience in that aircraft type. And from avweb.com, Air Force to use augmented reality helmets for training. The Air Force is expected to roll out augmented reality helmets next year that will be able to pit fighter pilots against the latest and greatest threats from China and Russia. The helmets, developed as part of a $70 million contract by military technology company Red Six, will have a visor on which battle scenarios featuring advanced adversaries will be projected. Better, faster, cheaper, Daniel Robinson Founder and chief executive of Red Six said, This is the way we'll train them in the future. Red Six board chairman Mike Holmes, a retired U.S. Air Force general, told the Post the current training regimen pits fifth generation against adversary aircraft built in the 1950s in mock combats that don't create a realistic battle scenario for the fights those pilots will face with the most modern Russian and Chinese hardware. It's expensive too, costing as much as $100,000 per flight hour. Holmes said his company's system offers an inexpensive and effective training alternative that U.S. fighter pilots need. To keep relevant, he said, we're going to have to push up our training game over the next several years. And in international news from AINonline.com, Australia offers VFR pilots ADSB avionics subsidy. For a limited time, the Australian government is offering a subsidy of up to $5,000 Australian for ADSB equipment on crewed VFR aircraft. The government's CASA agency is hoping the grant program will encourage more VFR aircraft owners to use ADS-B. Currently, ADS-B in Australia is mandatory only for IFR operations. According to CASA, the rebates can cover as much as 50% of the cost of purchasing and installing eligible ADS-B transceivers. To apply for the subsidy, the aircraft must be in either the CASA Australian Aircraft Register or a register of an approved Australian Sport Aviation Organization. Applications will be accepted until May 31, 2023, or until funding is exhausted. Operators should note that the selection process is competitive. Make sure you include enough detail and supporting evidence in your application to help us decide whether to award you the grant, said CASA. And finally, from InsideNova.com, Warrington, California pilot charged after flying at low altitude over Orange County neighborhood. A pilot from Warrington faces misdemeanor charges for flying at extremely low altitude over the Lake of Woods community in Orange County earlier this summer. The Orange County Sheriff's Office said the incident happened July 10th at 2.05 p.m. when the pilot flew over the neighborhood at a height of less than 100 feet. The Sheriff's Office identified the pilot as James Jelinek Jr., 65, of Warrington, and arrested him Thursday for reckless operation of an aircraft, according to a news release. The California State Code Jelinek was arrested under defines reckless operation as flying, quote, carelessly or heedlessly in willful or wanton disregard of the rights or safety of others, or without due caution and circumspection, and in a manner so to endanger any person or property. Jelinek faces an August 26 court date. According to FAA records, he received a private pilot certificate in 2014 and is a fractional owner of an RV-6 single-engine aircraft. <laughs> 
Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, more information on the Watsonville mid-air collision, including many of your emails and comments. And then we'll be hearing from AME Dylan Caldwell about what to do before your next flight physical. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Let's talk more about the Watsonville mid-air collision that occurred last week, which we talked about in episode 243. Since then, I've also posted a video about the crash with additional information. That video is available to all of our Patreon supporters and anyone else because I've made it available for everyone to view. I'll include a link to the video in the show notes, and you can also find the Patreon site at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, and that video will be in the post section. By the way, the video shows the radar tracks of both aircraft, something you won't find in a lot of other videos posted about this crash, as the 152's ADSB data didn't show up in some of the more commonly used aircraft tracking sites, even though some prior flights for that aircraft did get captured. And the accident did occur at exactly where the base leg meets the final. So when the 152 pilot said that he had the twin in sight, he was still on base, and there would have been time for him to turn back to the downwind to follow the twin. Now, the names of the victims have been announced. The pilot of the Cessna 340, which came barreling in at 140 knots, was 75 years old. Interestingly, he held a private certificate and multi-engine rating, but no instrument rating, which is surprising since Watsonville is close to the ocean and often shrouded in fog. Now, that means he could have had surprisingly little flight instruction as it takes only 40 hours to get a private, and a multi-engine rating could be had in under 10 hours. His 67-year-old wife, who was not a pilot, was also on board. Now, you've probably heard about six degrees of separation, which is the idea that all people are six or fewer social connections away from each other. Aviation is a small community, and I think it's more like two degrees of separation between any two pilots. I had mentioned that I was guessing the twin pilot and his wife had a property near the ocean as the aircraft regularly visited Watsonville on weekends. That turned out to be the case. They did have a condo on the ocean near Watsonville for somewhat less than a year, and it turns out that my wife knows the prior owners who sold their condo to that pilot and his wife. So yet another example of how closely pilots are connected to other pilots. I got a lot of listener email and based on what I'm seeing, I think that the accident has affected how people now think about fitting straight in aircraft into the traffic pattern based on my experiences in traffic patterns during the last few days. Here's what I said about straight in approaches in the Patreon video that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago. So in summary, there were many factors involved in this accident, and if any one of them had been different, this accident might have been avoided. If the twin had flown its normal slower approach, there would have been more time for it to look for traffic. The FAA's AC90-66B, Non-Towered Airport Flight Operations, says, quote, entry to the downward leg should be at a 45-degree angle of beam the midpoint of the runway to be used for the landing. So straight-in landings are not the usual way to enter the traffic pattern at a non-towered airport. Regarding straight-in landings, the AC says that pilots should, quote, clearly communicate on the CTAF and coordinate maneuvering for an execution of the landing with other traffic so as not to disrupt the flow of other aircraft. Yet the pilot of the twin was late to inquire about traffic in the regular traffic pattern. And if the 152 was still on base when he spotted the twin, a better choice might have been to return to the downwind. Regardless, both pilots could have done a little better job in their final transmissions of communicating their position and their intentions. And here are some of my recent experiences. Two days ago, I was finishing a trip bringing a new Vision Jet and its owner from Knoxville, Tennessee to California, and we did a long straight into runway 33 at the Lincoln Airport near Sacramento. We called when we were 10 miles out, and at that moment, a Cessna 172 was just turning left crosswind. Coincidentally, those were the exact same positions of the two accident aircraft at Watsonville when the twin made its first call. As we got closer to the airport, the 172 said without being asked that they would make a 360 on downwind to accommodate the straight in vision jet. Now, that's not something they had to do, but it made sense. Yes, straight-in traffic should defer to aircraft in the normal traffic pattern, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to try to force a twin or a jet to join the traffic pattern. And here's why. If a jet has to maneuver to join the traffic pattern, you now have a much faster aircraft in your traffic pattern. And frankly, it's much safer for the straight-in jet and the aircraft in the pattern to get that twin or jet on the ground as quickly as possible 
rather than force them to join the pattern where they're going to be faster than other aircraft in front of them and behind of them. So I'd urge you, if you're flying in the traffic pattern, to go ahead and try to accommodate faster straight in traffic by letting those aircraft land and getting them out of the air as quickly as possible. One way to do that is to simply extend your downwind and then turn base behind the straight in aircraft and land after it. By the way, not all twin and jet aircraft do try to muscle themselves into the pattern by flying straight ins all of the time. Today I was flying with a different vision jet owner who's based in the Central Valley and flies into Watsonville regularly. I said to him, don't you always enter the pattern on the 45 when you fly into Watsonville? And he said, quote, why would anyone fly straight into that crazy airport? It's the busiest non-towered airport I go into. Now there's a smart pilot. Of course, jets are supposed to be flying in a higher traffic pattern at 1500 feet AGL, which makes it easier for them to be in the pattern without overrunning other aircraft. But here's an interesting story from Patreon supporter Thomas Dean Weeble, who supplies some of the photos that I used in my video about the crash. Here's what he wrote. Quote, incidentally, we had the almost exact setup in the pattern today at Watsonville. See the screenshot. A 152 and a 172 on downwind, and a citation coming in fast straight in. The 152 complained on the radio that the citation should follow the recommended pattern entry, upon which the citation replied, nope, minimum fuel. Unfortunately, only the end of that conversation is on live ATC. The 152 gave way to the citation. And Thomas later wrote, yeah, I checked the AIM and minimum fuel just applies to ATC communications. Even there, you should not expect priority. And later he wrote, after reflecting about this a little more, I guess one personal takeaway for me is that I should not expect a pilot of a bigger, faster airplane to necessarily be a safer pilot. I must admit that I thought that pilots that fly jets and other high-performing airplanes must be better pilots due to their vast experience. However, I do not think this assumption holds. The Citation pilot on Tuesday appears to have a dangerous attitude, namely macho. The twin pilot last week was way too fast for landing. I remember two other instances from the past year where a pilot of a jet was not behaving. One was similar to what occurred on Tuesday. In the second case, I saw a jet taking off runway 27 at Watsonville. Runway 27, as always, was closed for takeoff at the time by NOTAM. Surely everybody makes mistakes. However, in my mind, I was correlating bigger planes to higher standards of piloting. Looking back, that assumption appears incorrect. And here's an email from mega supporter Jim Winter. Jim says, hello, Max. Hope you're well. This Watsonville midair has really weighed on my mind. I fly out of a non-towered airport, and it gets really busy with a lot of mixed-use traffic. I hope you will consider dedicating a show, or at least a segment of a show, as to how pilots can avoid getting in a situation like this. As for me, I'd always just extend my downwind and not worry about who has the right-of-way. I'd rather be alive than right. Thank you, my friend. Keep up the good work. I spend a lot of time on the road, and your podcast is all that I listen to. Jim. Jim, thanks so much for that. And Patreon mega supporter Stephen Elop and I had an extended email discussion about the crash. I had said that there was no logical reason for the twin to be at 180 knots all the way to short final, since the gear and flap speed for that aircraft are 140 knots, and the pilot had said he was planning a full stop landing, which wouldn't be possible at those speeds. So he seemed to somehow lost situational awareness of his speed. Stephen wrote, and it just hit me, an alternative explanation for what happened. As you highlight in the video, the radio calls were pretty good. The twin pilot was on the CTAF for some period of time prior to the accident. He was listening to the pattern calls from the two Cessnas in the pattern and the one on the VOR approach overhead. Potential answer, he sped up in order to beat the two Cessnas to the field. If he didn't get in before the first one, he would have had to reposition, maybe with an overhead turn, maybe with a big looping turn to join on the 45, and would have had to follow two slower aircraft. His weekly straight in approach to runway 20 was going to be disrupted unless he beat the 152 to the runway. Sadly, the 152 hit the ground first. Tragic. And I replied to Stephen, I thought of that and should have mentioned it. I also think perhaps the Cessna 152 pilot was thinking the same thing, that is, to try and beat the other pilot, since he turned base earlier than he did on any of his four prior circuits in the pattern. Sad to think that both pilots may have been in a race. Yeah, it's just, it's just kind of overwhelming when you think about that as a possibility. And here's a comment from patron supporter Sparky. He wrote, Encountered a similar situation last Tuesday when I was one of two GA aircraft in the non-towered night landing pattern. When Gulfstream 5 showed up, he wasn't clear enough with his intentions. I extended my downwind 
and the other GA traffic followed me, expecting the G5 to turn base leg from the right downwind. We were on the left downwind. But he went out to the initial approach fix, which would be more than five miles from the airport. Had he been more clear, we'd have been able to make our normal pattern ahead of him without issue. Instead, we found ourselves out at least five miles waiting for the G5 to turn around and land. Next time, I will be more proactive in figuring out his intentions. I knew I was in my right to fly the normal pattern and turn in front of him. I didn't feel comfortable turning in front of a significantly faster airplane, and I took the most conservative course of action. It's worked for almost 50 years of flying. Sparky, I totally agree. I often tell people that when faced with two choices when flying, I try to always choose the more conservative option. Now, today I was out flying with a student pilot in a Cirrus SR-20 at the Hollister, California airport, which is a non-towered airport with intersecting runways that's just 18 miles away from Watsonville. We started on runway 24, which the winds favored, and as we were switching to runway 31 to do some crosswind practice, two other aircraft arrived and began using runway 24. One of the aircraft belonged to Civil Air Patrol, and he joined us for at least one crosswind landing on 31. The other aircraft had a Lady CFI on board, and she and her client were on runway 24 the entire time. And though we had three aircraft flying intersecting traffic patterns, we had zero issues, and the aircraft remained well separated. And that occurred because all of the people in the pattern had exceptionally good communication skills and constantly stated their position and their intentions. And in one case, an aircraft departing on runway 24 delayed his takeoff when we were on final for 3-1. As I left the pattern, I thanked the other aircraft for accommodating our crosswind work on 3-1. And the lady CFI said something like, I'm all about teaching safety, to which I replied, yes, me too. Now, I contrast that with the experience that we had as we were arriving at Hollister about an hour earlier. I announced our position 10 miles to the northwest and said that I would cross overhead the field at 2000 and then fly outbound to enter on the 45 to make left traffic for runway 24. A minute or two later, a voice announced that they were maneuvering for runway 24. Since the aircraft didn't announce her position, we had no idea where that plane was. Another minute or two later, the aircraft announced that they were maneuvering for the downwind of 24, but again, no indication of where they were located relative to the airport. I spoke up and I said, I understand you're maneuvering for runway 24, but where are you located? And I got no response. Fortunately, I matched that aircraft's call sign with one that showed up on our ADSB in, and I could see that it was a 172 that was also coming in from the Northeast and that it was two to three miles ahead of us. When that aircraft made its first maneuvering call, it had apparently been about five miles Northeast of the airport. Now, if you were to draw a four-sided box around the airport, that extended five miles in each direction from the airport, you'd have a box that was 10 miles on each side. And that box would encompass a hundred square miles of airspace. And this aircraft that was maneuvering was at the edge of that hundred square mile box. Now, how on earth are pilots supposed to understand where other aircraft are if they don't give their position and say they're just maneuvering for runway 24 when that aircraft is somewhere within a 100 square mile box? I mean, people, you have to accurately announce your position. If your CFI didn't teach you that, hey, you need to convince yourself that it's essential. Now, there are a number of videos and blogs that are out about the Watsonville crash, but probably the best one I've seen was a post written by Paul Bertorelli, who we had on the show in episode 225. Here's what Paul wrote in part on avweb.com, and he was referring to some of the other videos and blog articles. He said they reviewed the recommended procedures for reducing risk in airport traffic patterns, but I think there's a larger consideration here that applies throughout the entire flight. Situational awareness. I have always defined this as a series of questions. Where am I? Who or what's around me? What happens next? What happens if I screw up? What happens if someone else does? I think it's clear that the pilot of the twin Cessna in the Watsonville crash lacked even minimal situational awareness. He was flying a straight in approach at the speed of heat and setting himself up for a classic high wing, low wing midair. And that's exactly what happened 200 feet above the runway. And if he had a good SA picture, he failed to act on it. The Cessna 152 pilot he overran appeared to understand what was happening, but acted too late to avoid the collision. The pilot of the Malibu that collected a Skyhawk over North Las Vegas, which is the other midair that we talked about a month ago, may have been similarly oblivious to the developing pattern geometry that would put the Piper into the face of the 172, flying an opposite pattern to a parallel runway. We can take all kinds of fly spec lessons from these two accidents, but to me, 
the overarching consideration is situational awareness. From that broad platform, all the details of specific tactics flow. The more accident videos I see and produce, the more I think this is getting down to social Darwinism. You can't completely depend on ATC to buttress your SA with timely pointouts. Controllers do an admirable job, but there are accidents where they haven't. ADSB is as close to an SA godsend as we're likely to see, but when the ranges draw short, you still have to put eyes on the other airplane and vice versa. The unique thing about mid-airs is that it almost always requires both pilots to be out of the SA loop, and that appears to be the case here, with the exception of the 152 pilot at Watsonville, who seemed somewhat aware of the risk, but not so much that it stopped him from turning base in front of a twin Cessna barreling down final like a lawn dart. So what I take from these two accidents is nothing about pattern entries or radio procedures or how fast to fly a final or even when to look out the window. It's the larger sense of situational awareness to apply to every aspect of flying from the pre-flight through planning all the way to landing. What's out there that will kill me and how can I keep it from doing that? If just one of the pilots in these two crashes had done that, I wouldn't have written this blog. Paul, well said. Thanks for all of your contributions to general aviation and to safety. So if there's any good thing that we can take away from the Watsonville midair collision, I hope it's that we can all be a little more careful when we're flying a non-towered pattern so we have lots of understanding of what's going on around us and that we try to accommodate other pilots whenever possible and not try to rush to get ahead of them. Now, we talked a couple minutes ago about six degrees of separation and maybe two degrees of separation in the aviation world. So let's test that out. Let's see how many of these people you happen to know. These are our new Patreon supporters who've signed up in the last week to help support the show. And if you'd like to join the club and support the show and be a member, just head on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, where you can sign up via Patreon. Or if you want to make a one-time donation, go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. We have a new mega supporter. He'll be getting one of my books in two months, and that's Carson Stilson, who's donating $50 a month, and I'll tell you more about him on a future show. Other new patron supporters at the $8 level include Matt Johnson, Robert Ward, and Andrew Yao. We've got a couple new $20 supporters. That includes Chris and Josephus Visser, and several $35 a month supporters, Joe Hilty, Scott Morris, and Hodel Today, which I don't think is actually their name. And we have some one-time PayPal donations. Thanks to Barry Harper for $50. David Tokoff also donated $50. He said, thanks for the great content on your podcast. I learn something new every time I listen and more often relearn many things that I've forgotten over the years. I'm glad he said that because I've been thinking about going back and revisiting some of the topics that we covered when the show first started over five years ago. So good idea there, David. We also have one new monthly PayPal donation, which is Scott Wilson at $8 a month. And I really want to thank all of you for your contributions and for helping to support the show in every way that you do. Coming up next, our conversation with Dylan Caldwell about what you need to do to prepare for your next flight physical. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let me tell you a little about Dr. Dylan Caldwell. He's an emergency medicine physician and a senior AME giving flight physicals in his offices in Naples and Pompano Beach, Florida. He owns a Piper Pawnee that he uses to tow gliders, and he owns several gliders and flies a Citabria. Now, he's also offered to answer any of your listener questions about FAA physicals, and I'll give you his email address after the interview. Now, here's our conversation with Dylan Caldwell. <laughs> Dylan, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Well, you had offered to talk about some do's and don'ts about flight physicals, which I thought made perfect sense. Let's start with blood pressure. That's certainly something that I'm always concerned about when I go, and I'm sure other pilots do as well. What are some of the do's and don'ts for people who have blood pressure concerns? Well, the, the big thing is that no one likes going to a doctor, and especially pilots don't like going to an AME because it's just they're always scared that something's going to bad's going to happen. So there's to a greater or lesser degree, there's always a certain amount of anxiety about what's going to happen because part of it's out of the control. Part of that will naturally raise your blood pressure. I see it all the time. And so things that others can do to help lessen the chance of being an issue is 
get some sleep the night before. Don't drink a bunch of coffee, especially espresso, right before you walk through the door. I see this happen again and again where people say, you know, their blood pressure's up. And I ask him, what happened? Did you drink any coffee? He said, yeah, I just had half a pot. And you go, oh, why are you doing that? My goal is to make things as easy as possible. They're simple things that any pilot can do to make it a lot easier for their flight physical. And one of those things is just avoid caffeine, avoid exercise, get some rest. It's simple as that. Super. Well, and th- this is so common that isn't there even a name for this? Don't they call this white coat effect that people who walk into a doctor's office, even if they're not a pilot, they may start to get elevated blood pressure? Yes. It's called a white coat syndrome, which is why I've never worn white coat it's in my career as an attending. And I even have my ex-wife's pink stethoscope that I use sometimes. Do what, In order to make people get as comfortable and relaxed as possible, and at least a good AME is not out to ground you. You know, my idea is to keep, you know, just like the saying, keep them flying. My, I want to do everything that I can do to keep pilots in the air or get them back into the air. And so we're not, out, we're not pilots enemies. I'm a pilot myself. I get nervous myself when I go to the doctor. I get nervous when I look in the mirror. You know, it, it's an understandably anxiety provoking exam, but there's some things they can do to make it less problematic. What about times of day? Does blood pressure tend to be lower at certain times of day? Well, it's going to be lower usually at night when you fall asleep. I mean, there's a, there's a natural drop in that. During the day, I mean, I don't think it makes a big difference in terms of what's in their exams, unless there are people who jones for a pot of coffee. So in which case they should schedule the exam early in the morning so they can then have their coffee afterwards. So they're not freaking out about not having that caffeine boost in the morning. Mm-hmm. What are some of the different blood pressure limits for FAA physicals for different classes? So blood pressure limits do not vary by class. It's all the same. Blood pressure can't be above 155 over 95. It's actually pretty high, which is good because it allows it takes in or allows some freedom for if people are anxious and their blood pressure is naturally high up just because of anxiety. The American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association recommendations for blood pressure are 120 over 80. You rarely see that. You know, that's just, that's the blood pressure of a teenage girl for the most part, you know. So you have a good limit of 155 or 95, but there's lots of things that people can do to help make sure they make it under that limit and make it a lot less thrilling exam. And if people haven't gotten treatment for blood pressure, what would you recommend that they do perhaps prior to coming to their FAA physical? Well, is this someone who doesn't know if this is someone who doesn't know they have hypertension or they're recently diagnosed? It all depends. Go ahead. Let's talk about both of them. So if someone has known hypertension and they're on medication, their blood pressure is well controlled, um, it's not a big deal with the FAA. Hypertension comes under a khaki condition. Khaki stands for conditions that AMEs can issue. So it's very easy to comply with the requirements for khaki for tension. They are, the blood pressure has to be 155 over 95. Most people are going to be lower than that. They have to be on the medication for at least seven days uh, without flying, without any signs of symptoms or any problems. It has to be one of, of many frontline medications for blood pressure and either their PCP or the AME uh, thinks that it's stable. Uh, and this is one of the few khakis where they don't need a note from the doctor, which makes it a lot easier. I, as the AME, can say, hey, I think this condition is stable. I fill out the worksheet, said yes, 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 yes. And I can just put khaki qualified hypertension. It's very easy. It's not something that people should work about. Pilots should not fear going on hypertension medications in terms of losing their medical. It's not a big deal uh, so long as it's well controlled. It's, really, it's one of the easiest medical conditions to have and still fly. So it sounds like you should really be working with your own physician on issues like this before you go see your AME. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's that saying that your primary care provider and your AME should never meet. You know, you shouldn't think of them as adversarial, but those kinds of chronic things are best dealt with by your primary care provider because their only allegiance is to their patient. Whereas an AME, I am a pilot's, a pilot's advocate. I do whatever I can to keep them flying, but I also have to respond and follow the, the guidelines by the FAA. It's just the, the nature of being a, a, an AME. What are some of the other things that we as pilots should or shouldn't do before going into a physical? The big things are sleep the night before, get some rest. Um, I've seen some pilots come in and they've you know, just flown in from Argentina and they're tired and their blood pressure tends to be high. And then 
trying to, uh, especially a near vision test, especially older pilots, as we all have, unfortunately, going to our read glasses, it just, it makes it a lot more difficult. So get some sleep the night before, the morning thereof, avoid caffeine or any other stimulants, uh, drink some water, drink a bottle or two of water, because there is part of any flight is, is a, a urine analysis just for protein and sugar. Drink water. It's a good thing. Don't exercise. Exercise is great, but don't do it right before your exam because normal physiology, your blood pressure and heart rate go up. The FA doesn't recognize that you just exercise and bike 20 miles, and that's the reason why your blood pressure and heart rate up. So do all those things. You know, really, if it tastes good, if it feels good or it's fun to do it, do it after the exam. Likewise, CFIs, don't pop over for exam in between given lessons because your blood pressure, you know, what CFI's blood pressure isn't elevated because they've been flying with brand new flight students. You know, it's just, it's not the time to, to, to have a flight physical. Make it easy. The whole idea is to make it as easy as possible. So you walk in, there's no drama and you walk out and go back on your life. And these days we really need to go online and fill some things out first before we show up for the exam. Talk about that for folks who may not have done this before. So, uh, 60 days, uh, within 60 days of seeing an uh, AME or a surgeon, you have to go to uh, the FAA to do the Med Express and fill out a bunch of uh, information online. For new students, it's uh, it's uh, MedExpress without an E.FAA.gov. And for new students, they have to, or new applicants, they have to fill out a bunch of demographics, name, date of birth, uh, address, hours, and so forth, then any health information. For people who are recurrent, they just have to, who are coming in for a, a week. For a renewal, they just have to update any information. Once they do that, that generates a 12-digit confirmation number. We need that confirmation number because we can't print out anything without that number ordered from the airman. And it would be helpful if they were to just print out their document and bring that with them along with the number, or doesn't that matter? For me, they don't have to do it. It's it's everything that they put in there, I pull up on the screen. It's a lot easier to read it on the screen. So all the, as far as I'm concerned, all they need is just a picture or a screenshot of that 12-digit number. That's all I need. It makes it a lot easier for, for them to find it too, and they don't have to waste a bunch of paper. Let's talk about basic med a little bit. Uh, it was new about five years or so ago, so we're all getting a lot of more experience with it. Which kinds of pilots should be considering basic med, and when in their flying career should they be considering it? So... Private pilots, particularly older, who have any medical problems are candidates for basic med. There are certain, there are, I think, 16 specific items that prohibit you from flying uh, under basic med unless you get a special issuance. If you have seizures, you're not going to be flying under basic med or under a regular regular first center class certificate. But if you have something like sleep apnea, unfortunately for the FAA, most of these people who are on sleep apnea have to go under a special issuance. And the reporting requirements can be somewhat burdensome. But those people under the discretion of the of the doctor performing exam can fly under basic med without as much reporting as required otherwise. So if you're older, if you're 40s and 50s, you have some medical problems, basic med is a great thing if you're a pilot. You know, if you're flying a turbine aircraft, obviously basic med is not a uh, an option because you're flying above 18,000 feet but for anyone in their 40s 50s 60s flying cubs 172s 182s RVs even Cirrus not the vision jets but even if they're you know as long as they're staying below 18,000 feet those are great those are great candidates for basic med. I fly under basic med I fly a Pawnee that's, that's all I need so I'm a flight instructor. Uh, tell me what should flight instructors either be telling their clients or not telling their clients about medicals? The one thing that I would caution flight CFIs about doing is not telling older pilots to get the highest class of medical, meaning a first class of medical, particularly if they're over 40. And I've seen this happen a couple of times where someone comes in, this wasn't with me, but they've come and seen another AME and their EKG is abnormal. and it's not necessarily a sign that there's something wrong with them, but then they end up being going under getting a huge number of tests that really probably aren't necessary to prove that they're safe to fly. And it just let, it, it ends up becoming a, a very time consuming, sometimes very expensive and a very anxiety ridden process for, for the student pilot. Particularly this person is just starting out and flying. There's no reason why a new pilot at 40, a new student pilot at 40 needs to have a first class call. Let them get a third class. Or if they're even thinking of going commercial, get them a second class. But don't 
don't tell students to get the highest grade possible or highest level, level certification possible because it's unnecessary and it opens up a can of worms. Likewise, down the same path that pilots shouldn't use an FAA flight physical as their routine health screening. They shouldn't use it as a substitute for having a PCP. All right. Because again, as an AME, I take care of pilots, but I also have to report to the FAA. And there's some things that just be, it's better off that pilots see a primary care provider whose only loyalty and concern is the person in front of them and not a governmental organization. So we've covered a little bit of ground here. Any other kinds of things that you'd like to touch base on to kind of suggest pilots think about in terms of uh, their next medical? I, I was it just occurred to me this morning, you know, you can think of an AME as, you know, as, a, as an IA, as an IA for the pilots. You know, all we're doing is inspecting and authorizing and saying, you're fit to fly. That's all our goal is. We're not trying to ground you. We're not trying to, you know, I fly myself. The last thing I want is an AME who's going to, and I don't think most AMEs are doing, are trying to ground people. They're just trying to say, hey, you're still fit to fly. We're not, uh, you know, we're on your side. Now, I've heard horror stories of some AMEs, and I know friends who've had trouble with, with AMEs who, for some reason, think it's their grudge to, I don't know, maybe we're going the route, down the route, but to ground people or to make things more difficult. But I think most AMEs want to keep people flying and do whatever they can within the law to keep them flying. That's great. Well, where can people find out more about you and the work you do giving flight exams? So my website is uh, aviatorsclinic.com and I have offices at uh, Naples Airport uh, in Naples, Florida, and then uh, a second office in Papado Beach over on the East Coast by Fort Lauderdale. Dylan, thanks so much for joining us here today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And my thanks to Dylan for talking with us today. You can find out more about him at aviatorsclinic.com, where you can also schedule a physical with him at either his Naples Airport or Papano Beach office. And if you have any question you'd like to ask him about FAA flight physicals, you can email him at ame at aviatorsclinic.com. Now here's a brief conversation I had with DPE Jason Blair about three weeks ago. He wanted to share some thoughts about virtual reality, which coincidentally we talked about earlier during the news. And here's that conversation. Jason, great to have you here. Hey, you said you had a story for me. What What's up, buddy? I do, and, it, and it's actually not a story of mine, but a story about a story, which is even more entertaining mm. than Max. You know, here we got a podcast we're doing, but let's talk about another podcast there's this guy that uh, a lot of people listen to called dan carlin he's got a hardcore history and he does some shorter episodes sometimes too because some are a little long we'll say a, a short 17 hour history of world war one if you're bored but um he did this really kind of cool interview with a, another guy that uh, many people out there probably know by the name of mike rowe mm. um another californian that that dirty jobs guy right so a lot of people know who he is and 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 they were talking about something dan did which i thought was really interesting and i promise max this is going to tie in to jason's thoughts in aviation somehow in the end okay so dan did this really cool history on on world war one and then got contracted by this museum to create a museum exhibit about world war one right seems interesting and in our brains we think old school here's our fake trenches and helmets and all this cool stuff and and they said yeah that's nice and all but let's go virtual reality Okay. So they created this this high end, and I, and I kind of want to just jump in a plane and fly to Kansas City to see this exhibit at this point, high end um, museum exhibit about World War One, where the the person gets immersed in it, right? And so we're thinking about technology here, and I'm going to tie this back to aviation because we've got some cool things. I think happening, but also some cool things maybe that should be happening. And when you think about a museum exhibit, they were talking and, and it's really cool conversation with two guys that are pretty well known and know this podcasting realm and know how to talk to each other. And they're talking about creating this museum exhibit where instead of maybe having a sign that you walk through to the next exhibit, that you're wearing is VR goggles. And you know, if we want you to look left, we have we have audio and maybe there's a gunshot on the left, and that makes you turn your head to the left and you see the next thing, right? This is really cool. But they also can take this to the next level. They were talking about how Dan had uh, this other company, this little company that, that they worked with on creating it. We're talking high-end called Skywalker Labs, right? Um, high-end movie production stuff, things that do things with George Lucas level, right? I mean, we're talking really cool stuff. And, and he said they had this guy at one point who said, well, how realistic do you want it to be? 
I mean, Max, what do you think? How realistic should this World War One virtual reality exhibit be? Uh, let's see. I don't want to. I don't want to get shot. Let's 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 put that out there. Right. So don't get shot. I think that was kind of where you know the he said. Well, Dan said maybe maybe uh you know we want him to, to feel a little bit of it, and, and and he said well if there's barbed wire and they turn their head should they feel it? Mm. I mean, good question, right? Can we add things in? And and, and then he, he said in a kind of quiet sense, this guy said, well, how do you feel about smells? <laughs> And he said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, we, you know, we've got this scent tower thing. And um, I mean, if they see a dead body, should they smell it? Ugh. And he said, Dan was like, well, maybe that's too far, right? I mean, yeah. maybe maybe we need the people to be able to get through the exhibit and not, not want to vomit on the way through. And I kept thinking about this and kept thinking about it. I thought, dear God, what are we doing in aviation? Like, how cool would it be if we could create that virtual reality simulator where instead we have your goggles on, we got you in a a chair that moves and, and it's it's about as real as it can get. And what if instead the instructor, instead of saying, George, I think maybe you had an engine failure, what if they push the centaur button that smells like electrical smoke? Mm. Is that going to change how you do your training? Is that going to change how your brain responds to this and, and how you would feel the you know the reality of that training that you're getting and boy i mean here we are doing this for a museum exhibit max why are we not doing this in aviation yet you know why isn't lucas films helping us create the coolest darn simulator around um and, and when we get to a point i mean at some point your brain doesn't really know the difference from a learning perspective right so um, maybe we've got something to learn here. And I just, I had to convey that podcast and, and get people thinking about it because it sure got me thinking about if we're doing this in one sector, why can't we do it here too? I vaguely remember having read about someone here in the U.S. who is doing some type of virtual reality for the beginning portions of uh, private uh, ch- uh, you know, training and that that had reduced the amount of time for students to get their certificates and had improved their learning. And to me, it makes total sense because there are so many things that we can do with radio communication and things like that on the ground that help people get prepared more quickly. But you're talking also about emergencies. I think that would be phenomenal. I think we could simulate things that we don't simulate in other ways. I think we might be able to minimize the amount of in airplane time by maximizing the effect of some of that simulator time. And and we all know that, you know, airplanes and, and pilots and instructors are in short supply. So if we can use other resources to maximize that training, we might actually be able to improve the pilot training pipeline a little bit. Yep, for sure. But but at least with emergencies, you could make them so real. I think a big question people have these days is, even if I've done the training, how am I going to react if an actual emergency occurs? And I think people may have a little bit more insight if they're doing it in a virtual reality environment where it feels real. And it's probably going to help them considerably if and when an emergency actually does happen because they may feel, hey, I've already done this before. I agree wholeheartedly, and I think we've got some things we can learn here. That's super. Well, Jason, thanks so much for your thoughts on this. My pleasure. And my thanks to Jason, who we've had on a guest here many times, mostly talking about check rides. You can find more of his work at jasonblair.net. And my thanks to all of you for supporting the show, whether you do it through your many emails, not all of which I get to read on the show, but I do read them. The reviews that you leave for us in your podcast player, such as on the Apple Podcast app, and of course, for your financial support through Patreon and PayPal. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.